Hello friends. We had our annual general meeting today and so we had some we're dealing with all of the technology we decided we weren't able to both record worship and have everything ready for the annual general general meeting which was also on Zoom. And so we didn't record the whole worship service but I still wanted to record um, our scripture reading and the message for this week's service. So I'd like to just share that scripture reading with you and the sermon as a way of keeping us all connected particularly as we begin Begin, um, begin Lent together. So our scripture readings today, our reading from the Jewish scriptures, comes to us from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 26 verses 1 through 11. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess and you possess it, and settle in it, you shall take some of the first fruit of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for God's name. You shall go to the priest, who is in office at that time, and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord. The God of our ancestors, the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And God brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. And now our gospel reading. Our gospel reading is from Luke 4, verses 1 through 3, and it's a very um, traditional uh, first reading for Lent. Jesus returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. There he was tempted for 40 days by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and afterward Jesus was starving. The devil said to him, since you are God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus replied, it's written, people won't live only by bread. Next, the devil led him to a high place and showed him in a single instant all of the kingdoms of the world. The devil said, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve God alone. The devil brought him into Jerusalem and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here, for it's written, The Lord will command angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus answered, It's been said, Don't test the Lord your God. After finishing every temptation, the devil departed from him until the next opportunity. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. I want to start my message today in a bit of a strange place. Often I get to the end of a sermon, I realize that I haven't got to the uncomfortable bit, and so it just gets left and or set to the side. So today I'm going to start there with a portion of the first line of our reading from the Jewish scriptures, where it says... When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it. These words make me deeply uncomfortable, and I feel I must consider them before moving on. 
The Bible is our book, and while we don't need to love all of it, I think we need to wrestle with the parts that we don't love in order to keep loving it whole. So I want to talk a bit about the Israelites possessing the land. I brought my discomfort to a biblical scholar and good friend of mine who never fails to draw me into wrestling and loving the Bible whole. Like me, she struggles with this text as well as all the other ones that follow dealing with Israel possessing, conquering, and dispossessing. Helpfully, she began by telling me that historical and archaeological evidence indicates that the Israelites did not kick everyone off the land. So why does the Bible say that they did? Well, they wrote it. And they were a conquered people, finally getting back a little control. Think of a hockey team, always the underdog, who finally squeak out a win. That becomes a greater and greater victory with every retelling. Also, Deuteronomy is likely written after the exile, so it is written by a people that, in my friend's words, have been completely dominated, enslaved, and abused. My friend then encouraged me to consider reading this text through the eyes of another. While still uncomfortable, it feels different to read the text not from the perspective of colonizers who have done the conquering, but as a conquered people longing for space to live in peace. So let's step into the shoes and the world of the Israelites. In Deuteronomy, we have the people of Israel. They have wandered in the wilderness, not for 40 days like Jesus in his temptations, but for 40 years. 40 years of trusting God as they lived in an in-between space, waiting for a promise to be fulfilled. Before that, they lived a life of slavery that covered many generations. And they longed for freedom, but they also longed for security. Exodus 16 says that not long into their sojourn in the wilderness, they were without food and complained, saying, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They longed for security as much as they longed for freedom. And then when they were finally readying to enter the promised land, they were told that once they possessed it and settled on it, they should gather their harvest into a basket, not the leftovers or the gleanings, but the first and the best, and bring it to the priest as an offering. Oh, that must have been hard. After 40 years of manna and wandering, I can only imagine they wanted to store up every little piece of grain, just pack it away, ensuring that they would never again be hungry, never again be without a home, never again be slaves. But that's not God's invitation. God invites them to walk into the place of worship, set that basket before the altar and say to the priest, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders, and then brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. Israel's capacity to trust had been tested again and again as they made their way through the wilderness. Relying on God's guidance and provision, here they are asked to trust uh, yet again in order to fully live into the promise of freedom in a new land. To receive this freedom, they needed to release security in the hopes of future abundance. They had to trust yet again in the providence of a generous God. God's invitation was not to fearful hoarding, but open hearts. Not to security, but to generosity. I cannot begin to imagine how hard that was. We are a people who love and long for security. We like to know that things are okay, that they will be okay. 
I asked some of my friends on Facebook what honestly came to mind for them when, I, when they thought of security and this is what they said. I want to be able to predict the future with a reasonable degree of confidence and have at least one version of that future be at least as comfortable as the status quo. My friends can be very honest. <laughs> I want protection from harmful people and situations. A safety net for when things get hard, financially, socially, physically. An assurance that there's a backup plan so I can be brave to take risks that feel scary. Housing, secure employment, rhythms to life that are familiar. Paid sick days and medical benefits, also the ability to know that life is not so precarious that one unfortunate hand of cards, like a car breakdown or a cavity, turns the whole game suddenly upside down. Believing someone loves me. We long for security, for that safety net, for the assurance that we are not alone in the wilderness, or maybe that we'll never be in the wilderness at all. When our water pipes freeze, what we want most, besides water, is a clear timeline for when it will return and when the porta potty will leave. An experience we had at church this past week. When a new disease begins to run rampant in our country and around the globe, we are desperate for a cure preceded by a clear plan for prevention and vaccination and the assurance that things will get back to normal as swiftly as possible. When one country invades another, we want to know who will take action, when and how, and exactly what we can do to help. We like to know that our lives our people are safe and secure. And when we are secure, or think we are, when we have what we need, or think we do, we hang on for dear life. And I don't know about you, but if someone tries to take my security from me, I spit. I am no better than the Yama Lama that was in the puppet video earlier in our worship service. Wanting security, I think it's normal. Maybe that's why the devil takes this approach with Jesus in the wilderness, offering temptations that will bring security. The wilderness is typically a place of wrestling, not security, a place of wondering and discernment. It's a place of discovery. Who am I? Who is God calling me to be? What is my purpose? It's a vulnerable space. Nothing says security like a full belly and the power to get more the next time we feel that raw rumbling. Jesus, after his baptism, returned from the Jordan River full of the Holy Spirit, but quite quickly, little else. He was in the wilderness fasting, eating nothing for 40 days when the devil comes along with the first temptation. Since you're God's son, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. If you're divine, you can do it. And there are lots of stones in this desert. You would be set for life. Never wondering, never worrying about your next meal and think of all the hungry people you could feed with the snap of a finger. On a personal level, this would be a simple way for Jesus to satisfy his own hunger and he could do it. Why suffer? As the one sent by God to proclaim good news to the poor, this act could quickly feed everyone. But Jesus says, people won't live only by bread. Sure, I could turn these stones to bread and it would be tasty. It would meet an immediate need, but it wouldn't be enough. Well then, perhaps nothing says security like land, wealth, and power. The devil tempts Jesus a second time saying, I will give you this whole domain and the glory of all these kingdoms. It's been entrusted to me and I can give it to anyone I want. Therefore, if you will worship me, it will all be yours. All you have to do is bow down to me and poof. On a personal level, this is pretty expedient. Jesus wouldn't need to go through all the work of teaching and preaching and finding followers. In his ministry, this paves the way politically or paves over the way politically. It would eliminate all the conflict, all the arguments with all the leaders. He could just do whatever he wanted. But Jesus says, it is written, you will worship the Lord and serve God alone. Sure, it would mean I could step right in and do everything my way, but the medium is the message. What would it say about who I am? 
about thee I am, who anointed me to proclaim release for captives and freedom for the oppressed. Well then, perhaps nothing says security like the power to defeat death. The devil takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple and tempts Jesus a third time, saying, Since you are God's son, throw yourself down from here, for it's written, The Lord will command angels concerning you to protect you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. You're divine. Show it off. Throw yourself down from the temple in front of all the religious and claim your divinity. But Jesus says, it's been said, don't test the Lord your God. Sure, I could throw myself down and defeat death, coercing people, forcing them to believe and in the process destroying all that they know of faith and life. But for what? What would that say about humanity? About my humanity? Each of these is a very real temptation for Jesus, and it's no point saying they aren't. There's a serious upside to each one, which is what makes it so tempting. Each is an enticement to security. And in some ways, each has the potential to be good news, even if not the sort that Jesus is going for. As theologian Fred Craddock says, stones to bread, the hungry hope so. Take political control, the oppressed hope so. Leap from the temple, those longing for proof of God's power among us, hope so. But at the same time, it's clear that this isn't what Jesus is about. The security, it's so tempting. But Jesus knows that in the end, none will bring about the shalom, the wholeness, the good news that he is meant to be in the world. Jesus is more than a loaf of bread, though he feeds the hungry. Jesus is more than a political powerhouse, though he becomes powerful politically. Jesus is more than divine, though he eventually rises from the dead. In all these temptations, Jesus foregoes security so that he can be generosity. And maybe that sounds weird, but what I see is Jesus choosing to shape a generous people who feed one another a precarious venture with an unknown outcome, rather than perform one miraculous but assured act of charity. I see Jesus choosing to help people mobilize as a community to overturn unjust systems, a task filled with late night conversations, testing from religious leaders and sometimes childish arguments, rather than force them to succumb to another, even if more benevolent imperial leader. I see Jesus choosing to show people how to embrace their humanity and the possibility of new life within this life, rather than denying his humanity in order to avoid the challenges of being one of them. Security feels so good and it is so tempting, but often it shortchanges all of us. Now I do want to say that there is a certain level of security that is everyone's right Everyone has the right to basic safety, food, water, education, shelter, healthcare, all those things that help us to survive. Jesus is not putting those up on the chopping block and neither am I. What I notice, however, is that once we have those things, often we cling to them, wanting more and more, working harder and harder as if we need more of them to survive when there might be another invitation that helps us and others to thrive. And I wonder if we, like the people of Israel, are invited to trust, to release security or striving for more and more of it for the opportunity of generosity. I'm a white woman living in an affluent and safe country with a secure job, home, family, and income. I will not or I try not to judge the decisions of those whose shoes I have not walked in and cannot even step into. But I know my own shoes, and I wonder how often I am choosing security over generosity, when the former simply ensures more of what I already have, but the latter invites me to something greater for myself and others, even if it requires more trust. A pastor friend in Winnipeg said to me this week, life is an offering 
which cannot be saved, but we have some say in how it can be offered. Life is an offering which cannot be saved, but we have some say in how it can be offered. This is a consideration certainly worthy of Ash Wednesday and the start of Lent. To me, this means each of us is given a life. We cannot box it up. We cannot store it away. We cannot protect it from every possible harm. We cannot stop it from gradually running out. But we can determine how it will be offered. That is an act of generosity that every one of us can participate in. And in the words of Mary Oliver, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Amen. One of the most difficult parts of worship, I find, is that what we, what we do when we leave the sanctuary, what we do when we, we are done watching the video, if you're like me, you may not remember anything that happened. Or maybe you'll remember some small detail, something you liked or didn't like. But for this reason, near the end of Lent, near the end of each service in Lent, what I'm going to do is include a so now what section. And that's what this section is right now. In our service today, we explored our nature as a people who long for security but are being invited to generosity. Basically, open hands instead of closed fists. Scrooge after the ghosts instead of Scrooge before. So now what? Well, maybe this week we can commit ourselves to just one action. And I'll give you two simple options and you can think up your own if you want to. Option one. Each morning, look at your hands. Make them into fists and consider all that you have. Think of everything that you have and then open them and invite God to show you how you can use what you have generously. Close fists. What is it that I have? What is it that I embrace? Open hands. How can God help me to use it generously? And option two, make one donation this week. It doesn't matter what size. Where you donate does. Think about what you want to do with your one wild and precious life and make one donation in that direction. And we'll see you again next week with hopefully a full worship service. May God bless you and keep you on your Lent journey.